documents that I have uh, personally been involved in interacting with uh, since 1996. I have another volume that includes a lot of files. And this is just to give you uh, an idea that 22 years ago, when Art Bell called me one night and said, Linda, I've got a box here, and it has come with some metal in it, and there's a letter. And he said, I want you to investigate what this metal is. Well, at that time, what we had received were little uh, ovals and round pieces and some strange things that looked like vents. And it came with, I thought, because we have the ability to do this by Zoom, that I go over with you what most people have not gone over. And this is the first letter that Art and I received April 10th, 1996. It's from, as I would find out from a phone call, uh, I'm the only person who talked to him, Art never talked to him. Uh, after he had sent this, the, the, the uh, man who was uh, called the grandson in this, um, he called me to say that I want you to know that what those type, the type letter is from my grandfather's handwritten diary. He worked in the army, he was in a security team, they ringed a craft, and it was wedge-shaped like a piece of pie, not circular and not lens-shaped. And he said, I am in the army as well, and I am heading off for Iraq, and I don't know if I will get back, meaning will I survive. And he said, that's why I decided I'd listen to you and Art for a very long time and I'm sending the uh, metal pieces that my grandfather left with his diary. What he did not tell us in this first letter or the phone call at the time was that the bismuth magnesium zinc would come in May, a month later, which is what I'm heading to. Well, what is important is to set some kind of a landscape for all of you about what is in this first letter that is important, uh, and I'll jump to the bismuth magnesium zinc letter uh, after I go through this. My grandfather was a member of the retrieval team sent to the crash site just after the incident was reported. He died in 1974, but not before he had sat down with some of us and talked about the incident. I am currently serving in the military and hold a security clearance and do not wish to go public and risk losing my career and commission. Nonetheless, I would like to briefly tell you what my own grandfather told me about Roswell. He uses the word Roswell. It is sort of now, that word has become like Xerox or Kleenex. Uh, the, it is very clear by letter five, and we had to go through these five letters that came periodically uh, from uh, April, this was the 10th of 1996 into July, that he finally, as we got toward that last letter, he said a latitude longitude from his grandfather's diary that the UFO was coming in on a trajectory and gave us the latitude longitude from the radar evidence recorded. It does not give us a date, but it is very clear from the five letters because he uses USAF throughout the letters. There was no United States Air Force until September 18, 19, it was on that day that Truman separated the Air Force and the Army official. It is also the day that he created the Central Intelligence Agency. And then six days later, on September 24, 1947, is the day that with a classified executive order that we know about because of leaks, 
that Harry S. Truman created what he called official Majestic 12, also to be known as Magic 12 or MJ 12, and that the list of the 12 all men were in three categories. Sciences, doctors, uh, the business people that he knew, and military. So, Roswell is leaked in terms of data to the first week of July 1947. That, uh, in the leaked Majestic 12 documents in the White Hot uh, document, uh, in uh, other uh, documents that Bob Wood and Ryan Wood and some of us have received and, and read in great detail. The dates that are used, or what you all have heard about from the Roswell data in the record, flying saucer crashes on Ranch in Mexico. The dates in the documents are between July 4th and July 6th. Mac Frazzle, the rancher who went into um, Cheryl Wilcox, he found the strange metals in a part of the ranch on July 4th, because that was the day he took off with his wife and his child. That's when, and he said, we're going to go into the sheriff's office. And so on July 4th, they went in. And that is important to keep that between the Roswell Army Airfield in 1947, you have to go at least 75 miles northwest into empty, totally empty ranch land. Corona is 35 more miles from the site. So this crash site, the original one that everybody's heard about, was not close to Roswell and it was not close to Corona. But it was tied to Corona because back then 35 miles was considered kind of uh, not much distance. So when you hear anybody say the Roswell incident, there really is just July 4th to July 6th and everything that we learned about that and that the government covered that up with a phony weather balloon story, which is admitted in the famous Eisenhower. Uh, there was a document that was an Eisenhower briefing. He was, uh, he became officially president in January of 1953. But the Eisenhower document bears the date of September 18, 1952. So that means that this general who became president, if you rack the time all the way back into England where he was and where he did a lot of the World War II discussions and, and strategy with Prime Minister Churchill, they were dealing with UFOs and Foo Fighters and all of that right around the time we entered the war. So General Eisenhower, who became president, had an entire decade of information that his colleagues in the government, going from FDR, who died April uh, 12th of uh, 1945, uh, then that you have a general in that war who knew all there was to know officially about UFOs. And in that document, it says boldly, we used the strategy of a weather balloon to cover the uh, crash at the ramp. It says it flat out. Now, I so- I think we've seen yeah. that document before. The Eisenhower document? Yeah. I had it published in, uh, an Alien Harvest and my two volume book, Glimpses of Other Realities, volume one and two. Uh, an Alien Harvest goes back, first printing was 1989. It's been through many. Uh, then Glimpses of Other Realities, uh, volume one and two, took me eight years to do. The first volume came out uh, at the end of 93. And then the second volume came out in 1998. 
And these documents that I'm referencing, all of them are in my book. So, so what's important is to keep in your own mind that the Roswell, even though it is used in here, that's July 4th to 6th, 1947. It's very clear from the US Air Force in these letters that it has to be after September 18, 1947. So it's probably 1948 and 49 and all the way back to 1983 when I started trying to do the hour for home box office. I was told by a military person that uh, there had been um, multiple UFO crashes uh, and that the issue of 48 to 49, I was told in great detail, about one that ended up with a live beam from 49 that was taken to Los Alamos where it stayed and communicated telepathically uh, with our government through 16 millimeter film. They said every day they ran 16 millimeter film with one of their military guys who uh, could get the, t uh, the telepathy of the beam really well. And they said someday they hope that they're going to show the world uh, the three years of the telepathic uh, discussions and that the uh, Air Force captain who had this dialogue with this being that they had gotten from one of the crashes in 49 said that the, most, the, the part that haunted him of everything that was uh, telepath was the gray type being telepathic we put you here, we made you, we put you here, but you have to live it. Implying that all of humanity and the planet is a laboratory experiment. So that's the kind of content that they were getting in 47 to 50. So now he's talking about uh, his grandfather died in 1974 and he said, I would like to briefly tell you what my own grandfather told me about Roswell. In fact, I enclosed for your safekeeping samples that were in the possession of my grandfather until he died, and which I have had since his own estate was settled. As I understand it, they came from the UFO debris and were among a large batch subsequently sent to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio from New Mexico. This is also another clue that this is later. It was right field up into the middle of the 40s. It did not become Wright Patterson Air Force Base until the end of the 40s, which then reinforces that I do not think this event, even though they keep calling it Roswell, it wasn't on Roswell, and I'm going to show you in a, in a minute where, um, based on these letters, I think it is. My grandfather was able to, and then the word appropriate is in quotes, which is a nice way he's trying to say, my grandfather walked over to a UFO, pulled off material from the bottom of it when somebody wasn't looking, and that's, that's appropriate means here. Uh, my grandfather was able to appropriate them and stated that the metallic samples are, quote, pure extract aluminum, plus quote and that is absolutely an honest sentence about the first shipment to our belt. These were all pieces that uh, the first place that I went, because Art and I talked about the way they look, and they look sort of like aluminum, so I called Alcoa, uh, said, uh, and we were a known factor, so I would just say I'm Linda Moles and how I work with uh, this radio broadcast and we reach five million people and we have received these aluminum pieces or whatever they are and i would like to learn from you at alcoa could you have been the maker of this aluminum could you explain why they are in the form that they are and all of that and uh after i shipped them off one day i got a phone call this was not a written report and it was from a manager of a department there, and he, his first question was, where did you say you got this? 
and I said, I, I, I communicated, it's an alleged UFO crash. Uh, it appears to uh, be somewhere west of Roswell, uh, and we want to find out, could you, Alcoa, have made this? He said, no. He said, this is 99.5% pure aluminum, and we do not manufacture in that quality. Well, that was the first kind of like, hmm, I wonder what we do have here. So in the first letter, not knowing, because Alcoa came later, he's saying it's pure extract aluminum. And then he said, I have listened to many people over the years discuss Roswell and the crash events as reported by many who were either there or who heard about it from eyewitnesses. As my grandfather stated, the team arrived at the crash site just after the Army Air Force, U.S. Air Force, which dates this after <coughs> September 1847, reported the ground zero location. They found two dead occupants hurled free. A lone surviving occupant was found within, and he uses capital B, little ISC throughout these letters, but twice in the letters, and especially he reinforced it in the fifth letter in July, right from his grandfather's diary, it says was wedge-shaped. And on the phone call with me, um, he said, like a piece of pie. Granddad said it was like a piece of pie. So it's not a disc. It's not round, it's not a lens, but the word disc, like Roswell, like Xerox, like Kleenex, was found within the disc, and it was apparent that the being's left leg was broken. There was a minimal radiation contamination, and it was quickly dispersed with a water solvent wash, and soon the occupant was dispatched for medical assistance in isolation. The bodies were sent to the Wright-Patterson Air Force Base for dispersal. The debris was also loaded onto three trucks, which finished the onload just before sunset. Granddad was part of the team that went with the surviving occupant. The occupant communicated via telepathic means. It spoke perfect English and communicated the following. Now, what I'm going to read is why you probably haven't heard much about these letters. Art. Whitley Strieber, I, others talked about this back in 1996. And the part I'm going to read now, everybody said, if this is a diary from Army security guy, and they're going to be talking about dimensional portals, uh, things that back in 96, they just were not discussed much. Today, yes, but in 96, so try to imagine where your own minds were in 1996, 22 years ago. And this is what is on page two of the letter that came with the pure aluminum pieces. The disc was a probe ship dispatched from a launch ship that was stationed at the dimensional gateway to the Terran, capital T-E-R-R-A-N, solar system. The occupants were part of a race of explorers from a solar system 32 light years from Terra. They had been conducting operations on Terra for over 100 years. Another group were exploring Mars and Io, which is one of the uh, moons of Jupiter. Each probe ship carried a crew of three. A launch ship had a crew of 100. The disk that crashed had collided with a meteor in orbit of Terra and was attempting to compensate its flight vector, but because of the co collision, the inter-atmospheric propulsion system malfunctioned and the occupants had sent out a distress signal to their companions on Mars. The launch ship commander made the decision to authorize an attempted soft landing on the New Mexican desert. At the same time, the inter-atmospheric propulsion system 
had a massive electrical burnout, and the disc was soon virtually helpless. There was another option available to the occupant, but it involved activating the dimensional power plant for deep space travel. However, it opens an energy vortex around the disk for 1,500 miles in all directions. Activating the dimensional power plant would have resulted in the annihilation of the states of New Mexico, Arizona, California, and portions of Mexico. Thus, the occupants chose to ride the ship down and hope for the best. They literally sacrificed their lives rather than destroy the populations within their proximity. The dimensional power plant was self-destructive and the inner atmospheric propulsion system also deactivated to prevent the technology from falling into the hands of the terrorists. This was done in accordance with their standing, the alien standing orders in regards to any compromise with contact experiences. Now what's interesting, this is not the only place in these letters where it is suggested that the aliens were in some kind of technology distress not expected and that they activated a self-destruct to all of the propulsion systems in the craft. That may or may not make where we're headed, the bismuth magnesium zinc, totally useless. But I can say that atomically and at the molecular level, because we're talking about nanotechnology, which did, which did not exist in any form in the white world until around this 19, early 1990s period. Um, because we did to bismuth magnesium zinc and how complicated it is, Several scientists and I have talked about this, including Al Putoff and Jacques Vallée and I and others. If there was a self-destruct, uh, let's say, burst of energy to make sure that whatever the bismuth magnesium zinc and the aluminum and all of the interior propulsion systems were destroyed before humans ever got to them, we will never know until we keep doing what we're doing, and that is constantly trying to understand how it is made, which is atomic and molecular placement, and what would it do, and the holy grail of neutralizing gravity is what is held out constantly, as this is what this material is designed to do. Has it been destroyed? That's what the letter implies. Have it? It's a question mark. Now, here's another part. You can see why in 1996, Art and I and others were we were reluctant to read any of this in any way on the air because we didn't have a clue at the time. What what are these metal pieces? And that's where my investigation <laughs> began. But he goes further. He said, Granddad spent a total of 26 weeks, uh, which would be uh, six and a half months, in the team that examined and debriefed the lone survivor of this crash. Granddad's affiliation with the project ended when the occupant was to be transported to a long-term facility. The being was placed on board a United States Air Force transport aircraft that was to be sent to Washington, D.C. The aircraft and all aboard disappeared under mysterious and disturbing circumstances en route to Washington, D.C. I've uh, made many uh, requests of contacts that I have in Washington, people who have been in past military who have actually been face to face with some of these beings, trying to find out is there anybody Steve, 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 you're the right number. Steve, you're Mike. God bless you and your knee surgery. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, should I go? Should I go? Is it? 
Are we back on? Yeah. 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 I'm, I'm not. Yeah. I'm not hearing anything. We got you. Okay, you're good. Now. Uh, audience. You're good now. Okay. Sorry about that. Ah. All right. <laughs> all right. Well, I, I really seriously hope all of us know what it means. The um, and I'll appeal to you guys. This is the kind of thing I would hope that MUFON and other groups could take on. Is there any evidence anywhere that in 1948 or 1949, maybe an obscure mention in a newspaper, that a plane was reported missing of uh, anything that would be, in, I think it's not after 48 or 49, so it would be two years have always wondered if there was anything that ever made it public or the newspaper about a mysterious disappearance of a large military craft. So far, nobody has ever come up with it. But that's what this letter said. And then he goes on, and this is his from his grandfather's diary. It may interest you that three fighter aircraft dispatched to investigate a distress call from this transport airplane experienced many electrical malfunctioning system failures as they entered the airspace of the transport that had allegedly the, uh, being, uh, the beings going to Washington. As they entered the airspace of the transport's last reported location, no crash or debris of the transport plane was ever found and the team, the security team that his grandfather was on was disbanded. And then he comes back to himself, this grandson uh, army guy. I realize that I have likely shocked you with this bizarre and incredible account and seeking to remain unknown likely uh, does not do anything for my credibility. And the metal samples only will likely add to the controversy. So that was letter one. Uh, that's right, there is one last paragraph in one. I am passing through South Carolina with an operational readiness mobility exercise in the Army and will mail this just prior to this exercise, possibly from the Charleston area. I will listen to your broadcast to receive any acknowledging or confirmation that you have received this package. This letter and the contents of this package are given to you with the hope that it helps contribute to discussion on the subject of UFO phenomena. Now here, in this first letter, is a paragraph that uh, Art and Whitley and Jock and I talked about. I agree with Neil Armstrong, a good friend of mine. Why would Neil Armstrong, the astronaut, and his army son be friends? Maybe it was that the grandfather uh, had a legacy in cybersecurity and may have met uh, Neil Armstrong. Uh, who knows, but that's the reference. I agree with Neil Armstrong, a good friend of mine, who dared to say at the White House, no less, that there are things, quote, out there which boggle the mind and are far beyond our ability to comprehend. Sign me a friend. Then, the, that was on the 10th, 12 days later, he wrote another letter. And in this, the, I'll just do a paragraph, uh, that he said, the occupant survivor of the crash refused to disclose technical information about the crash, refused, despite a series of interrogative <coughs> attempts to extract technological data. No means could be found to secure the information from the live being that they were trying to communicate with. And he said that the grandfather wrote in his diary that there were always two security team members present at every face-to-face -face meeting with the survivor. The survivor had the ability to deduce thoughts and questions prior to our ever asking. Sometimes it became frustrating. The disc itself 
was literally dissected and it was discovered that the propulsion system had actually fused together the many interior components. There were control type devices forged in the shape of the alien hand, which were assumed as controls and activation surfaces. Uh, I had a man walk up to me in a conference in 2014 and conferences are good because they're protective for whistleblowers. And I had uh, given a presentation and I was totally surrounded by people, 30, 40 people. And uh, the physicist, this is what I learned, this man was waiting. I could, he'd been there the whole time. It was very clear and he was waiting for everybody to clear. And then he said, I know a lot about the bismuth, magnesium, zinc. And that began a dialogue, and I'm gonna go from a piece here into the letter about the bismuth, magnesium, zinc, and then back to some more He said, in the 1970s, from 70, approximately 72 to 78 or 9, he said, I work underground in S4 uh, at Area 51. And he said that I worked on a slab of this material that was six feet by three feet. And what I'm going to show you is these were, you see, this is a photo that I took at the Franklin Mint because they had a special lens. What I want you to see, see those, all those layers. It's built like a torque cave, but the, the bottom is black and the top is silver because it is nanotechnology built. The black was always on the bottom of the pieces. And I was able to work with Carnegie Institute and the University of Michigan and a lot of scientists about what is this, how is it made, uh, and what exactly are the constituents. And the bismuth bottom was one to four micro. So extremely thin. And in that year of 1996, making this even more fascinating and ironic, that was the, approximately the year that I think it was in nature or science that there was a story having to do with the brand new huge frontier horizon that was coming on the planet, having to do with nanotechnology, which is manipulation of atoms and molecules, and said right in the article, one to four microns is the magic doorway into atomic and molecular manipulations, one to four microns. The, the bismuth in this metal, each black layer was between one micron thick to four microns thick. The next layer was 97.6% magnesium, 2.4% zinc, an alloy that was 100 to 200 microns. That is a single hair. Just take one of your hairs and think about that. That's the, the width of the magnesium zinc, and the bismuth is about half the size of a human blood cell. A, a human, average human blood cell is eight microns, the bismuth was one to four microns, so we are at the size of a human blood cell or less. Alternating like a torque cake up approximately 30 layers. And that's what you're looking at here. Those layers. And this piece was maybe three quarters of an inch long, less than a quarter of an inch wide, but I wanted when I uh, lived in Philadelphia, uh, and I knew an artist who worked at the Mint, and uh, I knew that they had cameras because of, they did lots of exquisite detailed shots. So we used a lens that the Franklin Mint then used on uh, small things, and that's 
how I got that photo. And at the same time, I took this photo from a different angle to just show how the top, the tops of these pieces glisten like a snowy field in the sun. You, you can't appreciate it. Uh, this was another thing that the scientists, uh, they said, if these go back to 48, 49, and we started working on in 1996, no, uh, there was just no oxidation, no deterioration, just bright, crisp, beautiful pieces. But all of them are small. People uh, seem to think that there is, that everything was somewhere like that, or the biggest one I think was like that. It's six pieces, all small. And uh, Art gave me, as I needed, various pieces they would be cut. I quickly might get some of a piece, and I would get some of a piece, and Jacques would get some of a piece. So we were dealing as best we could with a very limited supply of a mystery. So I'm going to leave this and just want to come back to the letter that came on, it was written on May 27, 1996. And uh, my originals are faxes, hard to believe, but that was the way we were communicating, Art and me, uh, were faxes. So Art would get the paper letters, send them to me, and I would follow up. So uh, from uh, April 10th to the end of May, so now this comes uh, almost two months later. There's just been the aluminum and other letters. And then suddenly, Art, I still remember, he called, he said, when have I got another shipment? And I have no idea what I'm looking at. He said, you've got to get into this. It's, and I remember he said this weird. Okay, so this is the letter. It's a short, it's a short one. I have listened with interest to the ongoing reports on the samples I sent your way, which means mine and what I'm learning about the aluminum. I noted that the researcher, me, discussing the testing of the samples, noted that basically it is merely aluminum. Well, I never would have said merely. I said it was 99.5% uh, pure aluminum. And actually, this is precisely the same initial findings of Grandad's team. However, I neglected to include metallic samples of the exterior, the outside. came from the exterior under side of the disc itself. It literally was a shell-like shielding of the disc. Brittle and layered, almost with a prefabricated design in placing. Well, it, it isn't almost. You're looking at photographs of something that was built atom to atom. That was confirmed for me by Cranford Labs in London. Uh, they had a piece and confirmed that it was entirely intelligently put together. Molecular and uh, atomic placement, which is what we call nanotechnology today. Keep in mind, Mr. Bell, that these are the last of Grandad's samples. They have sat for years inside a closet with his personal effects. Because of certain concerns, I will
not be contacting you on this matter. Perhaps I am a bit paranoid, but I do have a family and career to think about. I hope you understand. Hope these last samples are helpful. and I will be listening. It was in the last Letter five, even though he made in that letter, it sounded like he was going away. It's in his last and fifth letter that was dated July 5, 1996. And what he's doing is, and this is at the time that he called me, that he was finally saying, I'm really not from the North and South Carolina region. I'm actually from Virginia, but I am getting ready to be shipped out to Iraq. I don't know if I will come back. And so he wanted us to know more. He said, regarding the precise location of the crash site from my granddad's journal. And then he puts in quotes. Trajectory track was plotted at 31 degrees, 20 minutes to 32 degrees north latitude. And then, so he's, the grandfather say it's going like this. Then the object stops, reverse course exactly without any discernible deviation and then proceeded to the impact site. Well, this in terms of humans, this is intelligent control, which may relate to the first letter that they were in trouble and they were trying to decide whether to do a dimensional jump and that it would have taken out five states and they make a decision that they're going to write it down that's what this is about. The object reversed course exactly without any discernible deviation and then it proceeds to its impact site between the San Mateo Mountains and Sierra Blanca and the object debris spotted near, it says near Roswell. Not possible if it's between the San Mateo Mountains in Sierra Blanca. And I'll show you. This is important because that latitude, longitude, the description of the mountains from the grandfather's own diary. Let's see.
is the Sierra Blanca right there. Do you see that? Yeah. Yeah. Sierra Blanca. Here's Roswell. Roswell's all the way east. It's a couple of hundred miles from Roswell uh, to this ridge. where the Sierra Blanca is. Then, here are the San Mateo. Right here. What is in between Sierra Blanca and the San Mateo? White sand. Exactly. All these uh, sophisticated physics calculations are that we might have something that this is what its function was or is right now on wedge-shaped craft in this universe operated by beings that are not homo sapiens and that our government ha knows a lot about this but duplicating what the non-human advanced intelligences that can work at atoms and move molecules the way children sit with blocks on the floor and move an alphabet. And how long will it be? How long will it be before the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, in, in, any of the black world labs are going to be able to do this? One of the estimates is said to be quite serious. It might be another hundred years before the world is advanced enough, if it survives its war, warring itself, before anybody would be able to interact with the terahertz and these particular layer pieces. So I do not know except that what I've shared with you today is that I have never worked on anything that taught me more, pushed me further, had me talk with incredible scientists about something that remains right now in December of 2019, out of reach. The physicists who have made hypotheses about what it would do. So I personally am convinced 
that the bismuth, magnesium, zinc, layered metal in operation <coughs> with the pure aluminum with the monatomic iridium are designed as skins to go on extremely advanced artificial intelligent machines that don't even need any organic brain in them. And if the organic beings are there, or they are not there, it doesn't matter to the use and the functioning of the bismuth magnesium zinc with the aluminum skin. He's cracked. Everything I know, these craft can operate throughout this Milky Way galaxy without any organic intel. They are self-activating software. And their ability to neutralize gravity is their ability to separate their advanced craft from any influence on the planetary body or lunar body or whatever body it is in the Milky Way galaxy and beyond that they're exploring with this technology. And you have to, uh, you have to read a lot, you have to study a lot about terahertz and neutralizing gravity and dimensional portals, which are without doubt. Now, if any of you, and this, this is important, I'm glad. My film, Antarctica, Alien Secrets Beneath the Ice, it, it is now in Amazon.com, uh, video on demand. It is in Vimeo uh, on demand. It has been there for a week uh, in both. And that I've already started getting feedback uh, from people who have served in the military and the science. That, um, that what Spartan 1 and Spartan 2 are saying in my documentary about the portals is absolutely true. And then we have been, we, humans, have been working with apparently non-humans, get technology in which we have experimented with and now apply portal jump uh, technology on this planet to the moon, to Mars, throughout the solar system and beyond. It's another part that the black world is hiding. And I guess finally, I just feel, maybe I should say to you guys, how many of you feel that as we enter 2020, that the white world should be told the big truth that we're not alone in this universe? And we should be told and shown photos and video, if not the beings themselves that are, have been identified since at least the 1950s as categories of allied friends who help us. Neutrals, which I'm told is the biggest category, don't care much about us. And the third pasta, a smaller group. And I ask that with respect that it seems to me that after 70 years of program policies of denial and secrecy since World War II, that humanity is weakened by being kept in a state of ignorance. And that if we could be told the truth that we're not alone in this universe, it might even have an impact eventually on humans wanting to kill each other. How stupid it is. Wars are so stupid. And that just breaking through to the headline, we're not alone in this universe, and the intelligences have been interacting with this planet for at least 270 million years. That's a quote from a DIA analyst who sought me out because of material I have in my books. So, in the big landscape, of trying to help humanity get past its own self-destruction. I guess I'm sharing all of this with you with the idea that if we all knew the whole truth, Earth might grow up. So with that, I turn it to you.
Okay, cool. All right, so uh, we only have about uh, 15 minutes or so for questions. So, uh, we've got questions, of course. Come on up. Do you have questions? So, where she can see you, please. Yeah, I can see you. You can see me? I can see you. Yeah, okay, the microphone, she can hear you. Okay, well. I'll say first, uh, thank you for the uh, conversation we had uh, for a couple of months about a uh, month ago about uh, the incidents in 2012. And the second is that I want to give you a heads up or a thought that I've been looking into is that in the beginning of the 40s, uh, John Carson went to get, together with uh, L. Ron Hubbard. And they were trying to land some rockets, or wanted to land some rockets that was going outside and wanted to go to Mars and all. So well, what happened was that, from what I can read, is the CIA got into with Elvarn Hopper and got him on board the CIA, and that's where uh, John Carson was being put aside. But they made a group before that happened, they had in 52, uh, there was an incident uh, where John Parson died. I'm just saying that all after that, everything got shut down like you talked about. Well, John Parson is working with Ron Hubbard. Jack Parsons, for those of you who may not know this, he was the first director of the Jet Propulsion Lab. And Jack Parsons was working many sides of the street. He's very intelligent, and he was trying to get closer to the non-humans, as I understand it, and wanted to see if they could conjure up the lamb or lamb being that Aleister Crowley had illustrated and had described that in a certain magical ritual had his being come forth. And that that is why Jack Parsons, with the young woman, did what was called the Whore of Babylon magical ritual to bring in something. And it was that when he did uh, this, we'll call it, just for lack of a better word, a black magic rite, something did happen. And I read many different, both private and public, facets that he may have opened up something neg negative and that our government became extremely serious about all of this because of that Jack Parsons magic ritual when they realized that we're in a universe that is surrounded by another dimension called the astral and that what is in the astral that can penetrate into this universe may be one of the key problems. And then that is what Jack Parsons was experimenting with. Now, I'll throw it back to you. That That's my understanding. Yeah, my understanding was that the Roswell incident happened shortly after. The timing is, uh, no, I do not believe, because if you go to July, four to six, that's the one that made the daily re record. In May, there had been multiple crashes in Socorro, uh, in places that were much, much further west. Uh, Kenneth Arnold, on June 20th, was seeing the nine car curved disks over Mount Rainier. So you've got May crashes in western New Mexico, you've got the Kenneth Arnold situation in June, and you don't have the crashes between Roswell, Corona, and White Sands until you get to July 4 to 6, 1946. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Other questions over here? Hello, Linda. My name is Joseph. Hi, Joseph. Getting the camera for you. Uh, first off, I think you're beautiful, and I really appreciate <laughs> everything that you've done uh, for the UFO community. Don't laugh, it's true. Uh, I had a few questions as far as uh, the uh, the extraterrestrials. Are they from 
other planets? Are they extra dimensional? Are they from in the Earth? Uh, where exactly do you believe uh, the source of these uh, other beings are, the malevolent, the benevolent, and the neutral? Thanks. All of the above, quite seriously. Uh, I'll try to do this in bullets. December 1999, took an entire month for this meeting. It was a DIA analyst who told me for 23 years his job was to analyze and monitor the competition and conflict, competition and conflict of three competing extraterrestrial biological civilizations that have been terraforming and mixing and matching genes on this planet for at least 270 million years. And he said, Linda, our government has proof that it has been 270 million years. And I said, sir, that's before the time of the dinosaur. And one beat, and he's looking straight at my eyes, no aversion, and he said, Linda, one of the three groups made the dinosaurs on this planet to be an 85 million year experiment. And he said, what bothers us is that we know that about 66 million years ago, that something happened here, and it took out 95% of life, including all the dinosaurs. That and I can tell you from absolute fact that we know that the gray Ebens, that's, what, that's the way he put it, gray Ebens, tall Nordics, reptilians, those were the three competing groups, and he described them in great detail. And he said, and we know that the gray Ebens which actually might be entirely artificial intelligence that is the residue of a once upon a time organic intelligence in this universe and that they are the brightest of them all. He said, we have had demonstrations where the grades can move an asteroid into another timeline or another dimension. And we know they can do this. And he said they knew exactly what was happening at the Earth 65 to 66 million years ago. And what bothers us is why did they not get rid of that six mile wide uh, asteroid piece that crashed into the Gulf of Mexico, created the Chicanoo Crater, and we know that what it is is down under the Gulf of Mexico. Why didn't they move it? Okay, so that was a tremendous insight on the graves from the DIA animals. And he went further and said that they know without any doubt we are dealing with technologies that will take a planet 8,000 miles in diameter, 25,000 miles around like Earth. And they have technology that literally analyzes the entire spherical geometry and volume of any planet. And in doing so, they then discover that there are huge, huge gas bubbles between the magma and the crust and that we have had non-humans for millions of years. They ha inhabit, they have bases that are in this planet. He said the Nordics chose to go down below the two-thirds volume of the Earth, which is all the oceans and the seas. And he said they don't build on the bottom under the water. They go down and they go through the bottoms of the basins of the ocean to where there are huge cavernous areas. And he said, what we began to realize is that the Nordics, because they analyze planets and moons on entire geometries, you take a planet like Earth, and out of 4,000 right now in the exoplanet, because we've gone uh, over 4,000 in the exoplanet research. There is not one in 4,000 planets that is anywhere like Earth. And so he said the Nordics, go, they know how to go through matter that's nothing. They go into the caverns. They've been based in huge populations because he said, 
what do you think this planet would look like if you took away the water? And my first reaction was like a child. I said, well, probably like an apple core. And he said, Linda, what is the dimension of this planet? And I fortunately remember these things. And I said, 8,000 miles. And he said, how, what's the circumference? I said, 25,000. He said, what is the deepest ocean? He was very Socratic. It was like I was dealing with aerosol. And he said, what, what is the deepest ocean? And I said, well, I guess it's the Mariana Trench, at about seven miles, six and a half miles. He said, okay. Put 6.5 over 8,000. And then you hit me. I've been carrying this elementary school idea that if you took the water away from the earth, it would look like an apple core. 6.5 miles over 8,000. Our oceans, as deep as they are, are like. Super thin a slight erosions on this huge planet and that when you actually begin to study and I find the geophysics of this planet absolutely enthralling to study and you realize that at the center of Earth it is not hollow gee <laughs> uh, it is an iron crystal sphere it is the most extraordinary, when you look in books, where they actually now can show you what the hexagonal structure under all the pressure of the Earth is on that iron, it is a crystal. We have an iron crystal sphere, and it is uh, two-thirds of the diameter of our moon. Wow. That is how big the crystal sphere is at the center. It is turning, rotating inside of like a river of almost 100% iron with some nickel in it. That's the dynamo. That's what gives us these magnificent magnetic fields that protect us from solar winds and all cosmic rays. Without it, this would not be a planet where anything could live 93 million miles from the sun and survive. This big, huge dynamo at the center of the Earth gives us life that we have on Earth. Now, when you go outside of that huge iron crystal, you come to magma. And magma is sort of like the consistency of jello. It's not liquid. It, is, it has substance. And you can, the temperature gradients through the magma it cools. It gets cooler and cooler and cooler. Where you get to these uh, concepts of these huge caverns are where you are between the magma layer and the crust. And we live where we live, where humans live on this planet. The average thickness is only 5 to 25 miles. Wow. Five to 25 miles is the average all over the earth wherever there are humans and animals on land. Put five miles over 8,000 miles diameter. We're living on the pink, it's like, it's like Kleenex. <laughs> the, the, the Kleenex is what we're living on. And so think of the volume as this DIA man was teaching me, that if you're the Nordics and you want to do laboratory experiments on Earth, you just go down below all of the oceans and you occupy two thirds of the Earth without humans having bothered. Fascinating. Thank you so much. I appreciate everything you do for us. All right, well, everybody, thank you so much for joining us. So we got to wrap it up, but um, I, I want to thank you so much for being our guest today, Linda. You were great, and uh, we really, really appreciate you. All right. So uh, we're going to do a quick drawing for the book. Somebody want to draw? Who's going to draw? Who's going to draw? Who's going to draw? She's going to draw.
Yeah. All right, call out the number. Okay, the number is, five, the last three are 546. Five, 546, all right. Yay. All right, let's draw one more for a sign. One more for um, a, a, a signed picture with Linda here. She signed this also. That book is also uh, signed by Linda. So go draw one more. Five four zero. Five four zero. All right. All right, everybody. Thank you very much. Um, wait, did I have any other announcements? Real quick before we go. Oh my goodness, let's look. Let's get it over here. Uh,
and uh, you know you had the whole a, a lot of that ancient alien gang there, and they were telling a bunch of the behind the scenes story about all, all the places they've been and all the crazy mishaps that go on while we're trying to film and all. Yeah, it is. It's just incredible. And uh, a couple of nights ago, we did not uh, end shooting until midnight, which then you don't get back to your hotel until 1 or one thirty or 2. And those are just the, the it is really intense. Uh, it is working 18 hour days. Parking is also a oh, problem. Oh, yeah. Today? Yeah. Last time we came, uh, the one time, there was no parking trouble. But pretty cool. Anyway, you got a few minutes, Linda, if you want to you know, do whatever. I, I'll show you guys because you jumped out. How many of you know about chocolate and fluffy from my YouTube? I do. You know about what? My, my chocolate and fluffy, my big tax that I uh, introduced my Earth Files YouTube broadcast on Wednesday. That's what I was asking. How many of you know about the cat? I do. I know, I know of the cat. I do. Well, here is... Oh, here we go. Look at guy. This is Chocolate. He's a Himalayan. He is one of the dearest uh, creatures on Earth, I swear. Uh, he's loving, he's wonderful, uh, he has grown to be a really big cat. And um, I, I started with the cats uh, two years ago, just thinking on that one show that what I was dedicating basically was that we're on a planet where humans should cherish all life instead of be uh, destroying each other and destroying the Amazon rainforest and destroying animals, it was like an appeal. I uh, love these creatures, and they have souls just like we do. I love them. <laughs> and now, his brother is the all-white fluffy who's downstairs uh, playing, and uh, now these guys get letters from all over the world. Uh, people, uh, ask me as much about chocolate and fluffy as they do about UFOs. <laughs> oh, wow. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> that's interesting. How are you doing, Lena? Uh, we got to... How are you? Hi. Hey, how are you doing? Uh, I, I really actually feel very innervated. I have been... I've had maybe four hours of sleep for the last five, six, seven days. That's my turn around But uh, I find that when you're uh, when you're not getting sleep because you're doing things that you really, really like, I think you end up with more energy, and that's the way I feel right now. It's been oh, yeah. unbelievable. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely. I know how you feel. Yeah. Yeah. So, do you have anything new for us that is interesting? Well, don't, don't get the meeting started yet. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, everyone needs to sit there, but I'm like so curious. No, she's got so much for us. She, uh, Linda has is, got so much stuff. I mean, no, one meeting is not enough. Uh, to no, I know one meeting is not enough. <laughs> yeah, she was asking me to talk uh, in an update about the business of magnesium zinc which is what we were uh, working on also in Los Angeles uh, this weekend. And I literally walked into uh, my house and my office an hour ago. And, uh, and chocolate is, when I go, uh, the kitties, uh, they don't want me to go. And they always climb into my suitcase like, you can't go. You can't. Oh, I know. Yeah, and then when I got home, like, he came and jumped up on the printer and that he said he's glad I'm here. That's why I'm I'm petting him. I have only been in the house for an hour. No, our, our animals are the same. They they really miss you and then when you get home they just want your attention. Yeah. So it's like kids. Oh absolutely. But I also heard a teaser from Joanne was there there's gonna be some awesome, awesome new ancient aliens coming up. Oh yeah, we Gosh, I have been going to LA, I think it's every month this year. 
and uh, we have gone from doing 12 programs a season to this 40 or 45. And, and Giorgio and Childress and me, um, we are three that they depend upon uh, to go to LA and do lots and lots and lots of hours <coughs> interviews and productions, which, which then get edited in. And so I, uh, I know about several that are really wonderful, but we're not supposed to talk about. They ask us to talk about. Don't you know what's going on? Well, that's why I called it a teaser. Yeah. <laughs> so the Bismuth Magnesium Zinc I can talk about because it's, uh, you know, it's a big deal and there is so much and we're going to be doing a really special uh, program on that. And, uh, All right. Well, let, let me do the...